Um, thanks everyone for inviting me here today to chat about this a little bit. I'm Zach Stewart with Douglas County, and I'm going to talk about a new project that I've got coming up uh, starting technically in a few days here called Stop Spiny. Here's a quick outline of what I want to talk about today. Um, I'll do a brief introduction to spiny water fleas, their biology. I'll touch on their effect on lakes and fisheries, as well as how they spread. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how they can be stopped and transition into the Stop Spiny campaign or Stop Spiny project. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about how you or, or colleagues you might have um, can get involved. So this will be a pretty brief presentation, about 15 minutes or so. And then if any time remains, I'm happy to, to take questions for sure. So this is the star of our show, the spiny water flea. Uh, the Latin name is Bithotrephes longimanus, or some go by cedar stromi, but you know, there's been changes to the, the taxonomy lately. Um, it is a zooplankton. As you can see from the photograph here, it's characterized by that, that really noticeable tail spine. Uh, that long pointy spine um, is pretty important for the way these guys function in our waterways. And, you know, they range in size from half an inch to three quarters of an inch, including the tail spine. So you can see from the, you know, the human finger in the photograph that these things are not microscopic. You can definitely see them with the naked eye, but they're also easy to miss because they are small and they're quite uh, transparent. So despite their small size, uh, these guys are actually predators. And when they get into a lake, they, they start eating other zooplankton and they really start changing the plankton community. There's currently no way to control them or eradicate them once we're established. And they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. So they, what that means is they can divide very quickly when conditions are favorable um, and infestations can really take off swiftly. So prevention is key, you know, since they can reproduce so quickly and there's no established way to eradicate them, we've really got to think about preventing them from getting into our lakes in the first place. Uh, and their biggest weakness is, you know, they can't really travel. They're not strong swimmers. They obviously can't travel over land and they desiccate and, and die pretty easily uh, when you get them out of the water. So that's good. Um, thanks, and please jump in if you have any trouble hearing me going forward. So uh, let's talk real quickly about the invasion and, and the movement of spiny water fleas. So this species uh, is native to Eurasia. It first showed up here in the Great Lakes in 1982 in Lake Ontario, and it was most likely brought over uh, in ballast water. Uh, in Wisconsin, it's NR40 prohibited, which is the highest level of, of regulation for an invasive species. And it moves in a few different ways. Um, the first way is through water. Obviously, any water remaining in live wells, uh, bait buckets, or anywhere in a boat could contain these spiny water fleas. Uh, and they also move quite readily by snagging on fishing lines. Uh, Don Brandstratter and, and Valerie Brady and a few other folks from University of Minnesota uh, did some great research that just was published this year showing that trolled fishing lines are the number one uh, risk for ensnaring and transporting spiny water fleas. They were a lot more risky than anchor ropes or downrigger cables or any other sort of equipment that's used. So that's, that's a big one to watch out for in prevention. And then uh, mud is another way that spiny water fleas can be transported. So uh, I'll, I'll skip the biology lesson in the interest of time today, but these spiny water fleas do produce uh, resting eggs, which settle down into the sediment. And uh, recent work by Brown and, and Brandstratter uh, show that there's pretty high mortality in these resting eggs. So mud is maybe not as risky as water 
or transporting the organism on fishing lines, but we still definitely don't want to be moving any sediment between lakes. So uh, the basic ways to prevent uh, spiny water fleas are, are just our normal AIS basics, clean, drain, and dry. And so you think about our Wisconsin statewide initiatives like drain campaign, clean boats, clean waters, and, and all the other uh, statewide programs. And these are all great for helping to prevent spiny water flea. Uh, so here we are to talk about fisheries again real quick. Um, I just wanted to mention that spiny water fleas do reduce that native zooplankton biomass when they get into a lake and they tend to alter the biodiversity and, and disrupt the food web. And they do that in two main ways. The first way is that they eat the same food that our small fish, like first year walleyes, also need to eat. So they're competing with the fish for the same food resources. Um, and for those interested in that topic, there's great research by Hansen et al. that came out last year looking at nine different lakes across Minnesota. And they found that walleye in lakes with spiny water fleas are smaller and they're less abundant as compared to walleye in lakes that don't have spiny water fleas. So that's, that's important to a lot of us who like to fish. And I think that's a good message to get out to folks. Um, the second reason has to do with the ability of fish to feed directly on spiny water fleas. So here's where we left off before. This is an image of a Daphnia. This is a native zooplankton uh, that's found in a lot of our Wisconsin lakes. And you can see it's, it's juicy, um, it's fat, and it's got this modest little tail spine. So I like to think that, you know, through a fish's eyes, uh, a native Daphnia might look something like that. It's a, it's a juicy hamburger. The spine is not that difficult to deal with. You just got to remember to remove that toothpick before you bite into it. Now, you contrast that with our invasive spiny water fleas, which look like this. And I'll draw your attention again to that significant long tail spine and, and the robust barbs that are located on there. And this is a much less appealing food source to juvenile fish. It's difficult for them to eat. And in fact, it can even cause internal damage uh, when they do cons consume them. So through the eyes of a walleye, uh, this food item looks a lot less appealing. Uh, in my imagination, <laughs> it looks something like this. Definitely not a good food source compared to our native zooplankton. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, a project that I'm starting next year is called the Stop Spiny Campaign. And it's a multi-county prevention and education campaign. Uh, our goal is to prevent the secondary spread of spiny water fleas. So if you look at the map here, the orange outlines are four county project area. And we do currently have known infestations of spiny water fleas in the St. Louis River estuary, throughout Lake Superior, and also over here in the Guile Flowage in Iron County. And we wanna prevent the secondary spread of those spiny water fleas into all the different inland lakes uh, in our area. There are four key activities that I'm gonna be doing in this project. And I just wanna, for this audience, I wanna make a little note that uh, for the time being, I'm waiting to hear back on a few different funding sources, and I'm focusing my efforts in this four county region of Lake Superior. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have opportunities to work outside this area, and that prevention will benefit all of us. So as we go through the four activities, I would encourage you to just think in the back of your mind about uh, opportunities in your area. And, you know, I'm still developing uh, this project. So I'm very open to folks reaching out if you want to get involved. So the first part of Stop Spiny will be educational presentations. Um, they're going to be a little more in depth than the 15 minute talk today. I'll be offering a virtual format. So it's very flexible and, uh, you know, can be brought to, to any audience. Uh, there will be an adaptable time frame, So I can do anything from a quick 
15 minute guest presentation to more involved hour long lecture or whatever uh, is gonna suit that audience the best. So keep in the back of your mind, if you have uh, an interested audience, whether it's a lake association group or a stakeholder group or a professional group who might wanna hear that talk. The second pillar of Stop Spiny is a multimedia campaign. Um, my partners at the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center uh, have developed all this fantastic media uh, in print. They have radio spots, short videos, and social media materials ready to go. And uh, in the spirit of you know being good neighbors and helping out uh, in prevention, they have uh, made all these materials available for us. And we're going to be uh, sending these out through a multimedia campaign. Um, think about if you have an email list or, or a physical mailing list who might be interested in seeing some basic information about spiny water fleas, like this pamphlet on the right, get in touch with me and, and we can think about uh, how to distribute this information effectively. Uh, and I also have ready to go posts if your organization webpage or social media site uh, might want to share some of this information as well. The third part of the project uh, revolves around these spiny water flea specific cleaning cloths, again designed at Minnesota AIS Research Center. Um, they are, I don't know if folks have used these, but they're called a Swedish dish cloth. And they've got this very unique uh, tacky texture to them. They're very absorbent and they're great for cleaning spiny water fleas off of fishing lines or soaking water out of uh, bait buckets or live wells. So think back to that Brand Stratter et al. paper that I mentioned uh, and the importance of fishing lines uh, in transporting spiny water fleas. So these Swedish dishcloth cleaning tools are going to serve as a reminder to anglers to clean off their equipment. Um, also an effective tool to do that with. But I'm hoping that as we distribute these for free to local anglers, it'll also you know, serve as a con conversation piece and give folks a good opportunity to do a little bit of outreach to anglers and make sure they're tuned in to proper prevention for spiny water fleas. Um, and then hopefully having one of these sitting in your boat ready to go will help build good habits uh, for anglers to clean out live wells and clean off fishing lines. There will be an opportunity to potentially put together some, some mass group orders and uh, there could be an opportunity to pool funds with different organizations to get a, a larger number of these printed up. I'll be working on that hopefully uh, this winter. So get in touch if you're interested in, in partnering on that effort as well. And then the last thing that I'm gonna do for Stop Spiny is develop a supplemental training for clean boats, clean waters workers. Um, I think everyone here is familiar with our wonderful CBCW program in Wisconsin. Um, I put on a training for this in the spring and I know lots of you do as well. So I'll be creating a short little module to add on to that CBCW training uh, designed to equip our CBCW inspectors with some specific information about spiny water fleas and make them feel comfortable sharing the stop spiny message with boaters that they meet all summer. Um, the idea here is to create some interest in those CBCW conversations and you know, share some species specific information about stop spiny. Uh, but then also, once folks get done thinking about stopping the spread of spiny water fleas and the impact on fisheries, uh, when it boils down to it, they're going to be motivated to do the same basic prevention actions that we promote for all aquatic invasive species. So there should be broad benefits from, from getting this message out there. So in, in summary, to wrap it up here, there's three big things that I'd ask everyone to do. You know, number one, 
is get your own house in order, clean, drain, and dry your equipment. Make sure you're watching out for spiny water fleas. Number two, you know, share the fact that this, this project is starting this year uh, here in the north and share the stop spiny message with your, your friends and your neighbors. And number three, reach out if you wanna get involved. Um, if you feel that you could contribute to any of those four big activities, I'll put my email address up in a moment here. And I definitely welcome folks reaching out. And if we can all work together and take those basic actions, hopefully we can keep our lakes healthy and uh, keep them stocked full of these instead of these. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. And a uh, big thank you to all the partners who are helping support this project. Does anyone have any questions for Zach? Zach, this is Greg. What's your status of spiny water fleas in that area right now? Is it, do you have any anywhere? Yeah, so we've got uh, infestations verified in Lake Superior. So of course that represents many different boat landings throughout our county and, and the neighboring counties. And then uh, there are also several popular recreational fishing lakes just outside of Douglas County in Minnesota, which are infested with spiny water fleas. And those are a big concern because we know that a lot of local anglers fish those Duluth area lakes and then you know, cross the river and, and fish in Douglas County as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Zach, this is Scott and Shano. Um, great presentation. Thank you for sharing. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, one, what's the I guess status of um, past monitoring for spiny water fleas in uh, inland lakes in that four county region that you that you had up there on your map. Um, are there any planned um, monitoring going forward in this? Um, I guess in the near term. And then second, how what's the um, viability of a spiny water flea on when it's on fishing line, um, I mean, how many days out of the water can they survive? Is it is it like that five you know, the five day dry period, or you know, recommending at least that before the before actually, um, or clean them off? I mean, one or the other. But what's what's the time period on that for their out of the water survival? Yeah, um, thank you, Scott. That uh, that was awesome. Those are two specific questions that really kind of get to the future of this work. And those are the two big topics I'm thinking about in addition to this prevention work. So um, yeah, great choices to look into there. I guess first to look at the monitoring, uh, the DNR does do routine monitoring and you can check for spiny water fleas in a couple of different ways. One being an Ekman dredge where you bring up sediment and send it off to the lab and the other being plankton toes, uh, vertical plankton toes usually. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there is some ongoing monitoring in our area in Douglas County, I forget the date, but something on the order of five to 10 years ago, spiny water fleas were discovered in Whitefish Lake and Inland mm -hmm. Lake. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was six years ago, if I recall. Uh, interestingly though, they've not been detected since. So the likely, uh, the likely scenario there is that they invaded but failed to establish permanently. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that warrants a, a recheck. And then, you know, over here in Iron County, you can see on my map that the guile flowage has a pretty significant infestation. So mm -hmm. I know that Zach Wilson, who works in that area, uh, does routine sampling. I believe he gets out there just about every season uh, to sample in that area. So I'm going to be hopefully traveling over there to work with him a little bit and uh, maybe get some footage of that effort as well. Um, my impression is that we could probably benefit from a little bit more 
uh, regular spiny water flea surveillance going forward. And that's kind of something I have in the back of my mind for you know either an expansion of this work or, or a separate future project if we're able to connect it with a funding source and and make sure that it's complementary to the ongoing efforts with the DNR. Um, and then the second part of Scott's question is really interesting too. Uh, if I understand correctly, he's asking about survivability essentially. And um, as I understand it, there's actually uh, some research in the works, again, just over the St. Louis River in Minnesota, um, where UMD, University of Minnesota Duluth researchers want to look into that in a quantitative way. We know that spiny water fleas have very short viability uh, and high vulnerability to desiccation when you take them out of the water. But uh, the concern is, you know, what is the difference between taking a single spiny water flea out and setting it in the sun? Um, you know, that's going to be rendered inert on the order of a few hours uh, mm -hmm. or less on a hot day. But that's not necessarily a real world situation because anglers in the area are finding that they will sometimes accumulate large clumps of spiny water fleas on their equipment. So you can kind of imagine if you had 100 spiny water fleas <laughs> gummed up on the tip of a fishing rod and then you throw it in a boat for an afternoon and you think it's going to dry out, well, perhaps the outer spiny water fleas are going to desiccate and it's kind of gruesome, but their, their bodies may actually preserve some moisture in the middle of the clump. Mm -hmm. And then if that clump falls into a new lake, you may still have viable, viable organisms in there. Um, similarly, you know, you can imagine maybe a spiny water flea can survive on someone's fishing line, uh, for five or six days if it's raining or if it's mm -hmm. moist and cool out, uh, but not if it's in the direct sunlight. So yeah. that's mm -hmm. a big question and uh, hopefully gonna be an area for some, some research in the next couple of years here. Mm 